Thank you for joining us from all over the world for our event, Weaving the Dream. My name is Shiva Tabotaboinajad. I'm an alumna of Georgetown School of Foreign Service and equally as important an alumna of Georgetown's Persian language program. I will be assisting with the question and answer portion of the event. If at any time you'd like to pose a question, please use the chat box feature and I will make sure our speaker sees it at an opportune time. Otherwise, we should have time at the end of the lecture. Questions are welcome in both Persian, English, and Finglish. I have the pleasure of introducing the founder and director of the Persian Language and Culture Program at Georgetown University, Professor Fatima Mostofi. She goes above and beyond for her students and this program. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mostofi. Salam bar hamegi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Persian Studies Program of Georgetown University, I would like to welcome you to Weaving the Dream, our first Jolly Nose lecture series in the form of webinar. We really appreciate your presence today and your interest in our cultural events. We are planning to have two more events in October and November that you will receive soon the information. Let me also extend my gratitude to the Jalunis family that without their help, these cultural events would not have taken place. Now I'm pleased to present to you Mrs. Safura Zurufci, that she kindly accepted for the second time our invitation on the same subject after the success of the first one, which was in Persian. Mrs. Zurufci is a designer, Persian carpet and crafts specialist. She's also the founder of NAR Collection, a design house focusing, focusing uh, on high quality hand crafted fashion accessories inspired by Persian art and culture. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Persian crafts specializing in Persian rugs from Al Zahra University, Tehran, and a Master of Arts in Illustration from uh, Tehran University of Arts. She also studied textile design at the St. Martin School, University of the Arts in London. Welcome, Mrs. Zurufci, to our webinar. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I would like to first start by thanking Mrs. Mostofi, the Jolly News Foundation and Georgetown University for inviting me to talk about Persian rugs, my lifelong passion. Now that we are spending more time at home, we get to enjoy and appreciate the objects we have collected over the years. Our rugs are one of these objects with a great history behind them. Persian rugs are pieces of art that we literally live on. While we're mostly at home these days, we may find time to play with our kids, exercise, or sometimes maybe meditate on them. They just simply bring joy, warmth, and beauty to our homes. For me, there has always been a connection between rugs and the meaning of home. One of my earliest childhood memories is the image of a carpet at my grandmother's home near the Caspian Sea, where I used to play for hours. The pattern and colors of that carpet would take me to an imaginary world. Historically, and in some areas still to this day, girls would learn how to weave rugs at an early age. They would weave a rug with all their hopes and dreams that they would take to their new home upon getting married. They would start their new lives on this beautiful and colorful carpet. They would play, eat, sleep, give birth and live life on this rug, a cycle that has gone on for generations. On this magical piece of art, there are beautiful elements and symbols with vivid colors which could bring a flourishing garden or a heavenly image to their daily lives. 
Today, I would like to take you on a journey to paradise through Persian carpet designs. The word paradise is derived from the Avestan word peridesa, which directly translates to walled garden. Interestingly enough, in modern Persian, the term paradise refers to both gardens and heaven. One of the first texts that refers to a heavenly garden is the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in Akkadian during this late second millennium BCE. Gilgamesh, the Akkadian king and mythical hero, enters a garden of jewel-bearing trees in search of an eternal life. As described on a relief found in Iraq, he was dazzled by all the beauty and lush greenery under the golden rays of the sun. He saw himself in the garden of the gods. This relief is of an Assyrian garden from Nineveh in Iraq, showing orchards and streams of water. It is one of the first depictions of a structured garden that we have from early Mesopotamian civilizations. Later in the book of Genesis, we see an image of paradise described as, and the Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The book of Genesis names these four rivers as Pishon, Jihon, Tigris and Euphrates. Many scholars believe that these rivers were located to the north of the Persian Gulf, either limited to an area in South Mesopotamia or at the extent of the Iranian plateau. In the Quran, when describing paradise, four rivers of water, milk, honey and wine are said to be flowing under trees of every description in a shaded garden of perpetual bliss. The common thread in these ancient scripts are how a search for beauty and eternal life through human history is found in a structured garden. The, the allusion to the four rivers in these examples has more than a passing resemblance to the concept of charbagh in Persian gardens. A charbagh garden is a symmetrical fourfold walled garden with water canals, streams, and ponds under the shade of trees. It is filled with flowers and the sound of singing birds. In other words, a paradise at a glance. One of the earliest existing sites with evidence of a fourfold garden is at Pasargod, the Achaemenid palace north of Shiraz. In this site, in this site plan of Pasargod, the Charbagh design is evident as a rectangular garden split into four parts by flowing water canals. The picture on the right side of the screen shows remains of the water canals on the present site. As you can see, the Iranian plateau is mostly dry and arid, which has led to a deeper appreciation of water and gardens. Canals, which are underground sloped canals, were built to deliver water to different areas of the plateau. 
Canals allowed not only towns and cities to flourish in inhospitable regions, but also for the creation of gardens in otherwise arid plains. Imagine, imagine traveling through a dry area. When you find yourself arriving at a walled garden, if you arrive with closed eyes and only open them after entering the garden with flowing streams, it would feel like you have been teleported to paradise in, a, in the flash of an eye. This beautiful garden, known as, known as Bogoshozde, is near Kerman in Iran. The appreciation for water and gardens also became an inspiration for carpet designs. As illustrated in this slide, on the right side, the site plan of Bogoshozde and the garden carpet design on the left have a similar layout. Regular rectangular divisions defined by water canals flowing through pools of water are irrigating this oasis. Throughout the history of carpet weaving, there has been an effort to portray paradise and gardens so that they may be brought into homes. This design style is known as the garden design road. One of the earliest notable literary examples of such carpets is the Baharistan or Spring of Khosrow rug, which dates back to the Sasanid period. During Khosrow Parviz's reign in the 6th century, this rug graced the enormous audience hall of the Teaspoon Palace. This lost carpet has been described by the Islamic historian Al Tabari in this way There was a huge carpet depicting a garden with streams and paths trees and beautiful spring flowers. The wide border all around showed flower beds of various coloring. This description illustrates a Persian garden as we know it today. And this design was common in garden rugs till the early 19th century. I'm now going to show you a few gardens that illustrate the similarities with garden design rugs. In the Fiend Garden from the Safavid era, we can see the fourfold design with streams flowing with water. Borafin is a beautiful garden in the arid region of Koshan that takes us to another world. Thanks to the streams of water and the garden's vegetation, it is a very pleasant and refreshing destination. During the Mughal Empire, the philosophy of Persian gardens and Iranian arts continued their reach to present-day Afghanistan, Pakistan and India. These pictures are of the Garden of Babur in Kabul, a good example of a classical Persian garden layout. This miniature painting brings to life the garden while Babur himself is directing its layout. When looking at these illustrations, you see a three-dimensional representation of a charbagh design with all its elements including walls that may be interpreted as borders in carpets. This slide is of the tomb of Jahangir in Lahore, Pakistan. Another good example of a charbagh layout in the Mughal era. 
The site plan illustrates a strong fourfold planning with water canals defining the layout of the garden. In this garden, the layout of the water features and their architectural similarities with the other gardens that we are looking at are more profound. The Taj Mahal in Agra, India is one of the best known architectural landmarks in the world that is based on the Char Bagh garden design. Shah Jahan created the Taj Mahal for his beloved wife Mumtaz Mahal to represent a piece of heaven on earth. Another majestic view of the Taj Mahal showing the strong axis defined by water canals and a central pool. Now through the next pictures of carpets, I would like to draw your attention to the resemblance between garden carpet designs and the classical Persian garden layout. This beautiful carpet is known as the Jaipur carpet. It is originally from Kashan and dates back to the early part of the 17th century. It was discovered in a locked storage room in the abandoned palace of the Maharaja of Jaipur at Amberfort in India. It illustrates an animated scene of animals, birds and fish roaming around a beautiful, lush and peaceful walled garden. The design is a wonderful bird's eye view of a fourfold or charbagh garden. This exceptional carpet is called the Wagner carpet, named after its previous owner. It has a calmer feel to it. When I look at it, I see a moonlit garden at night. As you can see, the dark blue background and the subdued colors reinforce that feeling. The designer is playing tricks with the viewer in this carpet. You can both see the carpet from a bird's eye view and at the same time see perspective in the design. The left and right side of the carpet in this picture are not mirror images. This layout is not a true bird's eye view of a garden as most typical charbagh designs are. If you were to stand on the right side of the carpet, it would feel as if you are standing under the branches of the trees, looking toward the other end of the garden where the trees are seen in full length. This is the first garden design carpet I saw in the National Carpet Museum in Tehran. It is the surviving quarter of a larger carpet. This one is a well-defined and much more stylized example for these type of carpets. We can clearly see and identify the sycamore and cypress trees along the streams. The wavy directional pattern on the streams shows the water current which brings life to this beautiful fragment of a carpet. This is another example from Kurdistan. It is very similar to the rug we just saw, using the same language for showing flower beds, sycamore trees, cypress trees, and fountains where water canals meet. I would like to point out to the directional waving pattern here in the center of the carpet and the cypress trees along the stream and the sycamore trees 
which are beautifully shown. And another example from Kurdistan that is even more stylized than the design we have seen up to now. The layout of the carpet is similar, yet the elements are visually different. Blooming flowers are more pronounced along the streams of water instead of cypress trees. As you see here, we can see blooming shrubs and flowers instead of cypress trees, which we had on the previous carpet. Garden design was such a strong influence that Shah Abbas Safavi laid out the new section of Isfahan, which was the Safavid capital, in the fourfold garden design. The main avenue was named Chaharbagh. As seen in this traveler's sketch, this avenue used to have a water canal running in the middle with smaller, smaller canals feeding it at intersections. During the Safavid era, Persian arts and carpet, and carpet weaving reached their golden age, where they started looking at garden design in carpets from another perspective. They broke down the garden into its elements. These elements are what we are going to look at now. They include flowers, flower beds, water, trees, and seedlings in gardens. We're first going to look at the flower element, which are known as the Shohabosi palmet. I have pulled out four examples of this element from this intricate carpet, so the flowers are more easily identifiable. Shoaposi flower is an elaborate and oversized palmet design with radiating petals surrounding mostly a central pomegranate-like shape. As you can see in, on this drawing, the pomegranate design on, in the center of the palmet and the radiating petals surrounding the core of this flower is well shown and you can see the resemblance of these of this design on this palmets on the carpet this carpet is a good example that shows the Shah Abbasi's palmets laid out as a flower bed the palmets are oversized and some even resemble vases containing flowers. That is why this rug style is referred to as Goldani or vase design. This is another vase design carpet, which is at the Victorian Albert Museum. The palmets are oversized and laid out in a regular pattern that conveys a flower bed. These both carpets are classical examples of this style. This fine weave is a vase rug from Mashhad, Iran, which is still a very popular design. The palmettes, flowers, and blossoms in this design are riding on infinite spirals that flow through the carpet resembling an eternal, flourishing garden. Another interpretation that is seen in garden rugs is known as the intertwined fish or mahi darham design. This design that focuses on the water elements of the charba pictures two fish swimming around a little pool. Water and fish are symbols of life, fertility, and blessing. In this picture, the two fish 
are further stylized and are shown as leaves circling a flower. As you can see, these leaves are actually the fish circling the pond in the middle. And you can see in this picture eight of them. And this is the pattern that they used to repeat it throughout the um, main field of the carpet. Looking at this example from Kerman is like looking at a small pool full of fish. The design's flowing blue background that helps visualize water brings motion and blessing to the home. The same can be said about this fish design from Bijar, which is even more detailed and dense. One of the interesting aspects of carpet design for me is how different regions have their own interpretation of the same elements. You may see intertwined fish in different carpets, but each region's layout, colors and details are unique to that region. This image is of a fine Tabriz rug with a detailed fish design. It is an interesting sample as you may also find the fish circling a pond in the wide border around the carpet. As you can see, these leaves or fish are circling the pond or this flower in the middle and it repeats along the border of the carpet. Moving to the next element, the paisley design, also known as botte, covers the interior of the carpet and looks like an enclosed cultivated garden. The paisley is seen as a stylized cypress trees by some and shrubs by others. I also see this design as a sprouting seed in a field, a field where life's seedlings take root and grow. This is an intricate design from Kerman, which includes a twist on the standard paisley design. It includes two intertwined paisleys, which are known as mother and child. This is another symbol of fertility and growth in gardens. I would like you to see these bottes or paisleys as mother and child. The bigger one is the mother and the one inside is the child. These rugs bring beauty, freshness and hope to the home, another garden or heaven that is entering daily life through a rug. Another witness to the voyage to paradise in Safavid rugs are the Mehrabi designs, which are also known as the prayer rug designs. In these rugs, a vignette of a beautiful garden is envisioned through the frame of a mosque's altar. To better illustrate this point, I've taken the liberty of superimposing the garden design rug onto the Friday mosque's altar. In the image on the right side, you can see what I mean by this Mehrabi design. In many cases, the altar is defined by tall Persian cypress trees on either side of the rug. The cypress tree symbolizes salvation and eternal life. This is an example of a Malaya rug, a region which I personally enjoy. This rustic orange color is unique 
to carpets from this region. These prayer rugs were not meant to use as regular floor covering. They were intended for prayer, where the carpet would act as a portal to heaven. One of the oldest surviving and most delicate rugs of the Safavid era is the Ardabil rug from the Sheikh Safi shrine. It was commissioned by the court in the 16th century and is currently at the Victorian, Victoria and Albert Museum in London. The Sheikh Safi rug visualizes paradise in another form the twinkling golden star-like flowers on undulating vines through the main field resemble the universe in a night sky. Although the same elements from garden design rugs are used, instead of looking down at earth, the carpet flips the concept on its head and makes us think that we are looking up toward the sky. The hanging lamps on either side of the central medallion are a visual cue that we are looking up toward the heavens. The medallion in the center of the carpet could also be seen as a shining star or could refer to the Sufi's belief of the unity of existence, which says that we have all come from one point and we return to that same point. As we've seen today, the definition of paradise and the imagery of gardens are intertwined. To envision a safe place that is filled with peace and harmony, the weavers would portray images from gardens in their art. Through carpets, we bring all, the, uh, all of those elements into our homes. We see flourishing gardens with running streams of water and flowers as a haven for leaving our troubles behind. The carpets that we bring into our homes are a window to a more peaceful world. Thank you very much for taking part in this presentation. Now I'm going to pass the lead back to Mrs. Tabatabai. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, Ms. Rushi. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, a common theme of the first few are, why have so many ancient carpets left Iran? When did the exodus begin and why? Was it for monetary gain by Iran, or were the carpets taken without compensation? So um, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think the interest in collecting Persian carpets starts somewhere in the 80s, in, in the 1800s, actually. Um, but uh, the, if they mean the carpets that we I've been showing are now not in Iran and mostly in other countries is because um, actually during the Safavid era, there has been um, carpets that are, that be, they've been woven just for other countries. Like they would give them as presents uh, to other uh, countries um to actually as a sign of their power um uh, it would be one of the best things that they could give as a gift and those carpets especially i didn't show any of those because it didn't go with the uh story that i was telling but most of them were um, woven by um with silk silver threads and gold threads and um, they're very um, beautiful and intricate. But then um, there is another reason that I came across um, during this 
research that I was doing was, um, well, when the shrine of um, Sheikh Safi was in need of money, they needed money to um, fix the um, building after the earthquake that they had. They needed money, so they had to sold this carpet, which became a very well-known, famous carpet, um, to a to someone from Europe, and then that's how it, this rug found its way to Europe. Um, but I don't know how um, exactly. But at some point, they started collecting, so the, in their interest. Uh, was um, the reason that they collected all these. Um, so, yes, and then like uh, the last carpet that I show uh, is another good example, the coronation carpet, because uh, so they need the carpet, so they were looking like for their um, for their, um, how do you say, the castles, the palaces, the, for their palaces actually, um, they would need, they would order some and they've collected some. So some of, specially made for some specific building and some have been collected. So but there has always been this trade between Iran and other countries. Okay, thank you. And the you, you mentioned your final slide, the uh, the coronation carpet. If I'm not mistaken, I actually think I've seen that one at Black. Yeah. And, it, and there are two, correct? Isn't there? Aren't there two versions of that carpet? Our our question. Our next question is: How unique is the design on a rug? Are they going to closely resemble each other in a batch or are they just going to have some ele elements or motifs across designs because of how intricate they are? I guess, how likely is it for there to be duplicates? Mm -hmm. So I believe every carpet is unique because depending on who is weaving the carpet, and the mood of the carpet and the pressure that the carpet would, you know, put when it's tying the knot uh, and the mistakes that they may make, it makes it unique. So no two carpets are exactly alike. For me, it's like that. And then when you said that um, this LACMA, um, this a coronation carpet in LACMA about that. I think maybe you're uh, uh, pointing to the Ardabil rug because there is two Ardabil rugs. Is that correct? I think so. I think you're right. Yes. Two Ardabil rugs. One is in the the one is in London and one is in LACMA, but the one in LACMA is smaller because they've used the, because it was not in this, uh, it was not in one piece when they found it and when they sold the carpet to this merchant. Um, after the earthquake, it was ruined. So they had to repair this carpet. So they used one carpet, um, they used some pieces from one carpet and fixed the other. And the complete one is shown in London, and the smaller one is now in Lakma. But they're both beautiful. The other one they don't uh, actually just don't. Uh, the other one doesn't have the borders. The borders are missing for the one in Lakma. And then the how unique the design uh, are. Um, again, as I showed you in the pictures, like for example. Uh, the fish design, the same. Oh, are we done? No, that's apologies. That's some a different alert. <laughs> okay. Um, so the same pattern can use in different regions, but due to their way of weaving and the colors, they would interpret their own um, 
view of that design, that their own concept of that design. And, you know, like the fish design, they were from different parts of Iran. So, and then they were not alive. They were, uh, they were the same design, but they were not that similar to each other. So the same patterns are used in different regions, but it has a different end result in the carpet. Hmm. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of questions about carpet weaving in Iran today. Um, specifically, are, are garden carpets still being made and have they undergone any changes as far as technically or visually because of increased globalization and industrialization? That, that's kind of a part one. Part two is how are these carpet weavers being supported as an industry? And then a third, if I could just tack that on, because I think these are all intertwined of are there, are, is there a way around sanctions of buying trustworthy pieces on, like Americans can buy online that's truly a Persian carpet? So sorry, that's three questions in one. Okay, the first one was again. How is the carpet weaving industry in Iran? So it's still, it's a very strong industry in Iran. So, because the tribal rugs, the rural rugs, the urban rugs, they're all still uh, being weaved. Uh, but um, the quality, I'm not sure, I'm not there now, but the quality, there are some very good quality uh, carpets still being weaved there. But um, for getting a good carpet, actually, I should say, now the best carpets are in the United States. Mm -hmm. After the revolution, so many people, they took their belongings here, they brought their belongings here, and some of the very beautiful Persian, old Persian carpets are, are now here in New York, in California, and in different places. Like, but in Europe, so all these beautiful, and the funny, thing is while I was in Iran and I used to work with some carpet dealers I knew that they would go to these auction houses in Europe and buy these carpets and bring them back to Iran because they had they left the country at some point and they wanted to bring them back so but I don't know about the sanction so it's not helping any industry so especially this one and then finally, just the um, increased globalization and industrialization, has that changed the way designs are incorporated into carpets, specifically Persian rugs? So design-wise or production-wise? I guess this is both for technical and visual, if you could speak to either. So I think now there's everyone are more into more stylized designs, like more subtle, stylized with neutral colors. Maybe it's because of the world that we're living in now. You know, we have so many, there are so many things happening around us. So when we get to our homes, we want to spend time in a more neutral, calm, calmer place. So maybe that's one of the reasons that designs are going toward that way. And so the design of carpets are leaning toward that way. And um, the other thing is, um, so I think that's it. I think uh, that's, uh, so, and there are so many uh, beautiful new uh, rugs, which are very modern and stylized, but still the, classical designs have their popularity. So that, that lends itself very well to our next question of, have the carpet designs or themes changed at all over the years? Or has it, you were kind of talking about the consistency of paradise and home, has that been a constant? It had, but not as much as it should have, I think. It could have evolved more during the, you know, over time, but it hasn't. It has been more 
um, there had, you know, in the past hundred years, if there was not that much change in the design. They were mostly, you know, the repetition, especially um, in um, tribal rugs, because like they, they don't weave from a plan. They don't weave from a, you know, design like on a car on a paper. They just carried this piece of um, carpet with different symbols woven on it. Um, so they carry that piece and then they just go with the, with their senses and how they like to weave the carpet. So, but um, uh, yes, I don't think that it has been changed as much as it should have, or it could have, it could have changed more. Okay, our, our, our next question, we have, we've got great questions coming in. Thank you, everyone. Um, could you speak a bit more about the production of these carpets, royal workshops, independent family workshops? Are, are they all pile woven carpets, wool and silk weft, silk warp? Mm, are, uh, which ones, the carpets that I've been talking about or? I, be, I believe the, the ones you've been showcasing, yeah. So um, the ones, uh, the, the carpet design, the, the garden design from Azerbaijan, those are, I believe, our most rural, rural um, carpets. Some wear tribal carpets, um, like the Bastiari, the, the prayer rug that I showed. Um, so there, there were all of them, like the, some of them were from the um, court uh, studios, some were from the uh, private um, uh, workshops. So they, they were all, there was a mix of all these different workshops in the slides that I've been showing. Okay. They're all, but there, there is no court uh, studio anymore, but all the other workshops are still very active. Okay, great. We have a question of how can you tell when or where a carpet was made and which ones are authentic? Um, where and when. So mm -hmm. we can just guess approximately because like we don't have the, you know, when, when you show me a carpet, I don't have a lab to go and examine and, you know, but from the, um, from the pattern, first from the design, you can identify the region of that carpet and then the colors and then the weaving style of that carpet which shows uh, which region it's from. And so then from all those uh, factors, you can identify a carpet region. Hmm. I agree. And it's all by experience, I believe, because it's really hard to, and then there's always these negotiations about, you know, whether, you know, because sometimes, which is very confusing, and that's one of the things with uh, Sheikh Safi's, um, carpet is the design, one design from a region is being uh, in, woven in another region. So it's very confusing. You see the pattern and then you, you think like it's a Kerman and then you look at the weave and then you see, oh no, it would be a Tabriz or vice versa, you know, it's just, but mostly it's the, the same design from the same, the a region is done in the region. I see. Great. Um, I know we might be coming up on time, but let's try to get maybe two more questions. Um, these, I think, are, are good ones. What One is, what does BB buff mean? And what region does it come from? And then also, has the role of the Persian carpet changed from its original purpose? 
the bbbop i believe if i'm not mistaken i just may say something that i'm gonna <laughs> regret later but i believe from what i uh, remember is from the region of hamadan so um i think that's the answer to that question and then what was the second one again the um so has the role of the Persian carpet changed from its original purpose? Mm. So I don't think that the, mm, so let me see, how can I put this? <laughs> so um, I still believe when we buy a carpet, we want to, bring a beautiful image to our home. So if we look at, look at the carpets in that perspective, it's still a vision of a better place, of a more beautiful place, which, is, which made us, you know, happy or which made us feel that we like it in a way. So we bring that piece, so we like it and that, the interesting thing is carpets are a piece of art that we um, um, we buy, but it's something that we interact with. It's not a painting that we would hang on the wall. It's not a sculpture that we would put on a table. It's just something that we would live on it and live with it. And, you know, as I said, it's just like, live forms on these carpets. So um, I don't know when, when, when people ask me what type of carpet should we buy? What, what kind is the best? What kind, what color is the best? It's like, it, you just don't, don't, don't think about the region. Don't think about all these other things. Just if it talks to you, if you fall in love with it, buy it. It's just like, there is, if not, there is, no reason for you to obtain a carpet if you don't if it doesn't talk to you why should you get it it's just as in if you know um, so i think still it could be an image of a better place of a haven place and it makes your home more homey and it makes your home warm and havenly um, so but the design, um, so as I showed during the Safavid era, it wasn't just the paradise garden. It wasn't just the, uh, it was not very loyal to the very classic design. So they would look at the different parts of the carpet and they would bring those elements to their homes. So always there are all these elements. One, one, of these elements well, is um, seen in carpets. So um, there is a heaven, I think. I don't know. I believe it is. Okay, great. We, we have a lot more questions. This is awesome. Um, one person asks, can you speak about the taste of the current Iranian population or Persian population in that they seem to prefer classical carpet designs, while Westerners now like the more village and tribal designs. Do you, do you see that as accurate? Uh, is it saying that in Iran, they're more after, more into plain and modern designs? Is that what it is saying? I, I just sort of... They're saying that Persians or Iranians prefer the classical carpet designs, and now Westerners are, are liking more the village and tribal designs. Or rather, what you think their tastes are, if you think that's accurate. I don't know. It, from person to person, it's different. I don't know. Uh, it's got some people from my generation, you know, even me and my husband, we have different tastes, so I really cannot say anything about that kind of kind of like what you said as long as the, the the rug or the piece speaks to you kind of like what you were saying 
Um, another question we have is some of the carpets that you showed were fragments. Do we know where the other parts are or why they were cut up? Um, I, I actually don't know why, but there are many fragments left in different museums. Like there is this vase design carpet. There is this fragment. I believe there are four fragments of the same carpet. I don't know whether, I don't think that they've cut it in four, but there are four fragments uh, of the same carpet, one in Washington DC, one in New York, one in London, and one is in another in the museum. Um, the reason I don't know why, but the, at some point, um, these rugs were uh, been cut out, cut down, like cut in pieces, or like they were ruined, like as the Sheikh Safi carpet, there was an earthquake. So, you know, these incidents happen and maybe that's one of the reasons. And then, oh, one other reason is, so because if they don't take good care of the carpet, so, you know, you know a part of the carpet can be damaged, so all these, good carpets were not at the museums at the very, uh, from the very beginning, you know, it were, they were in houses, they were in, uh, you know, storage. Um, so, and then like in Europe, uh, the, the way the sun, um, you know, the, the sun affects all these carpets, so the color, you know, maybe uh, sometimes you can see half of one carpet is faded, the colors are faded, and then the other half is not. You know, there are so many different um, factors that can affect a carpet. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, are you familiar with the Pazirik carpet? And any re and anything you can mention about that carpet in particular? P A Z Y R K, Pazirik. Pazirik. So yes, actually Pazirik is the um, is the oldest um, piece of carpet in existence in one piece which is now in uh, Hermitage Museum in, in uh, Russia. And it's dated back to five, I believe 500 years BCE. So it's almost 2,500 years old. And the reason that it's still in one piece is because it's been found in a tomb in Siberia. And the, the cold climate of that region made this uh, piece frozen. So it was frozen in that tomb um, uh, of a noble person. So I believe they would they used to bury a noble person with their belonging. So this carpet was one of those. Um, so, and it was found, I believe, in the early 90s, like around 100 years ago, they found it. And that's the only reason that it's still in one piece. Because like, we don't have any carpets from 500 years ago. We don't have any, there are very few pieces left, but this luckily, because it was frozen, this one is uh, still, um, this one still exists. And it's a beautiful, it's a, and actually the thing is, um, because of, according to its fine weave and the design, um, it shows that the history behind um, weaving is older than this period, like maybe a thousand years before this carpet 
there is this um, history of weaving. Okay, great. Um, the next question we have is, what does tribal mean in Iran, either sociologically or in terms of carpets? Yeah. So there are three or four, if I'm not mistaken, tribes in Iran. One is called Qashqai, one is called Bakhtiari, and one is Shah Saban. And then there is another one, which is called Yamut on the east of Iran, in the east of Iran. Uh, so these are the tribes that we have in Iran. So um, if they're wondering if they're tribes in Iran, yes, they are tribes. And then the carpets and the kilims and the different things that they uh, weave are considered as tribal. And tribal rugs, and in tribal rugs, the uh, loom is different. It's not vertical, it's horizontal. So but the, the way they weave is different. Okay, great. Um, I think we're going to wrap up with a couple more questions. We aren't going to get to all of the questions, but Ms. Zurufchi has kindly offered to answer them and send them out to the ones that we don't get to. Um, Let's end on this question of, is the myth of a Persian carpet intentionally being not 100% perfect because it would be too close to God and, or any basis and it doesn't have any basis in reality or is it just a myth? I guess is a perfect carpet a myth? Okay, I didn't get the question. So this person is asking, you were saying that every carpet is unique and every knot and everything, no two carpets are the same. Do you think that intentionally Persian carpets are meant to not be 100% perfect because it wouldn't be an accurate representation of what life is? I think that's what the question is asking. It's very, it's a deep it's question. An interesting interpretation. Um, <laughs> But some of the carpets are actually perfect, like all the, they're perfect, but they're different. That's what I was trying to say. You know, it, even the ones with mistakes actually are very perfect to me. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's intentional. Yeah, these, yeah, it, I don't think personally, but there are stories about these. Kind of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have time for seriously one last question. Um, can you talk about modern designs being implemented in carpet weaving? So modern designs. Um, I see, you know, their perception the weavers and the designers' perceptions are more stylized from the same elements, the, the same and the classical elements. I can see that, you know, they, they change that, they twist that, the, the design and those concepts, but um, I don't know what they mean by uh, using a modern elements. Was that the question? I don't I didn't get that part. I think it's it's asking about um, modern designs because I think in showing modern yeah. designs, I don't know how to define modern, but it's I uh, I think it's more stylized and maybe um, less colors are used. So modern, more modern carpets are like that, more stylized uh, designs and. Uh, less vivid colors, more subtle and neutral colors are being seen. Um, so for me now, you can say that, because there are so many things, as I said, so many things 
happening around us. So a haven place or a heaven for us would be a place with less distraction, less um, elements, less figures, less colors. So something neutral would give you more peace of mind, more um, joy um, according to our surroundings. Okay, great. And if you're willing to answer this next question, I think it would be a good note to kind of close the event. Um, what can be done to preserve the traditional art of making carpet? Well, actually, I think that's out of my expertise. <laughs> I have no answer to that question. All right. Well, thank you so much. Hanu Safura, uh, for your time and your patience and, and sharing your love of rugs with us. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone for attending, um, and we will see you at our next event in October or November. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shiva Jun. Thank you, everyone, again.